I said that uh, one of the unique things, um, and that's why we're also here now, is uh, that all of the Fraunhofer Institutes have a very close collaboration with the university. And there's at least one person, which is the executive director of the Fraunhofer Institute, who works on both sides. The executive director of the Fraunhofer Institute manages its, its, its institute or her institute, and the typical size of the Fraunhofer Institute is anywhere between 100 people and 1,000 people working at Fraunhofer. But at the same time, uh, this professor has a chair at the university where an additional uh, 50, 100 or 500 people are working more uh, on the basic research in this particular topic. Um, so the university is doing basic research, teaching, training. Fraunhofer is doing applied research and tries to turn this, this uh, technology know-how into innovative products, into innovative technologies that have to go out into the market. And since we have this very close collaboration with the universities, it's a typical way of students like yourself that they study at the university. Um, and I'm pretty sure you also have to write your thesis, be it master thesis or PhD thesis at some point. And that can be done at Fraunhofer. And if you do it at Fraunhofer, you work on uh, topics that are immediately of interest to industry. So uh, industry gets to know the students very early stage of, of your study and you know what industry is really interested in, make sure that you study in the right direction. Um, so there's a very close collaboration between both. We have access to basic research and the university uh, has done access to um, very modern equipment and, and uh, modern technology. So there's really a win-win situation uh, between uh, these two entities. And that is definitely a unique thing in Germany and with regard to students like yourself, you see this is uh, the opportunity that, that you would have uh, in knowing Fraunhofer and maybe even going to Fraunhofer and writing one of your thesis or working part-time if you would be in Germany uh, for Fraunhofer. Now Fraunhofer, uh, it's, it's difficult to understand um, if you really want to know what we are doing, but MP3 is known and that's to be honest, the only product that's known in Germany, uh, even though we have been around for 65 years, uh, but all the, the Germans really know from Fraunhofer is uh, they developed uh, MP3, but we are doing a lot more. And here you see a wide range of uh, fields um, that address different uh, industries. And if you look at the core fields that you are going to study later, you will find all of them involve civil engineering, is, uh, for example, Palo uh, Alliance in building innovations. So we have many institutes focusing on civil engineering topics, uh, and, and they partner in our internal alliance, which we call um, building innovation. Uh, computer science this is one of your uh, fields, and you see here big data, cloud computing, uh, just as an example, uh, where we do uh, half many institutes working on different aspects in uh, computer science technologies, microelectronics, uh, just to give you one example, embedded systems or um, the top left, electronics. These are all fields which require microelectronics um, expertise. Um, so what these six fields that you are going to um, be offered and, and can, can choose one, um, all of them um, are also addressed in, in the later stage at Fraunhofer once it gets to uh, applied research. Now, since Fraunhofer is doing uh, so much, I have to, to focus on, on some fields, and I uh, chose automobile production, since I know that's also a very strong field in, in India. And just uh, within this field of automobile production, we have some 18 institutes uh, offering uh, different expertise in uh, uh, automobile uh, production, and here you see them. Each title that is listed here on the bottom is 18 different titles. That's one institute. So, in the first one, we have an institute for industrial engineering, or an institute for chemical technology, which is working on all aspects of composites, um, fiber reinforced composites, uh, for example. 
uh, then certainly all uh, the manufacturing technologies and advanced materials or new materials, a big thing uh, in automobile production. And I don't want to go through this entire list, but what you see is it takes quite a large set of disciplines to address the needs of the automobile industry. But these are all engineering disciplines. So that's a wide range of things you can can do later on with um, what you are going to study here. And if you look into into um, automobile manufacturing, in these days uh, the uh, OEMs, the automobile manufacturers, uh, they think more and more about resource efficient manufacturing. And resource efficiency means uh, you want to use as little material as possible, as little energy as possible. Uh, so that's for the uh, manufacturing. Part, but uh, in operation, the car should also um, have as little CO2 uh, emissions as, as possible. So, resource shortage, uh, as I said, increasing energy and fuel costs is one driver for uh, changing things. And then you go into two directions in automobile production. Uh, one is the production phase, so it's certainly the starting point uh, that you want to reduce. Uh, the emissions, the CO2 emissions, there's a strong legal requirement to do so. Uh, and uh, that's a very big challenge for, um, especially for, for the um, uh, engines of automobiles. And then on the other hand, you have the operation phase. You want to uh, reduce the consumption, fuel consumption, and uh, with that reduce the emissions. Problem is that in, in these days, uh, everybody would like to have a unique car. Uh, you don't want to have a mass product, you want to have your car, uh, if possible, just designed for yourself. And that's uh, the contradiction that, that we have, that the number of parts uh, are going down. Uh, and as we said, it's very challenging to optimize um, the uh, manufacturing of, of, of for this product. And here you see again, uh, what that means, uh, for the example is a Golf, Volkswagen a Golf. Um, um, again, we have to distinguish between the manufacturing phase and the, the operation phase. Um, just 20% um, of the um, CO2 equivalents, they are caused during the manufacturing phase. So we can do whatever we want to do. We can only optimize these 20% through manufacturing of cars by choosing the uh, lightweight designs, for example, as we're going to uh, see uh, tomorrow. 8% um, uh, is cost uh, by fuel provision. And then in operation, 70% of the emissions happen during the operation of the car. So here, the challenge is to get to better designs of the drives of the motor. Um, that's why Everybody's talking now about electrical uh, vehicles. Um, not to forget the last 2% uh, for recycling. Um, in the total for a Golf like this, during its entire lifetime, uh, CO2 um, emissions is, in this case, uh, 27.4 tons. So that's how an automobile manufacturer has to calculate this product. They cannot just look at the starting point uh, the process they use to manufacture, they have to go through the entire lifetime and make sure that uh, the CO2 uh, emissions uh, go down. And what that means is that uh, all these uh, manufacturers um, are very much looking now into setting up what we call E3 factories, so there are three E's. The first one stands for efficiency, the second one for energy and emissions, and the third one for the workers, so the, the human aspect. Uh, but the efficiency, you have to get to the efficient systems and, and efficient processes. And then on the energy and emission side, uh, we have to uh, try to get to emission neutral um, manufacturing uh, processes. Let me give you an example of that, what that means. Uh, this uh, slide shows the production line uh, for uh, gear teeth manufacturing. So there are, there are many processes, many steps before you have uh, uh, um, this component, which you'll see in a little more moment. And uh, that's how it's done today. 
And what we are now doing is we try to shorten this process chain. Because if you manage to do things uh, not in seven but in five steps, this may be, it doesn't have to be, but it may be a good uh, way to reduce emissions to get the products done faster, more efficiently, use uh, less material. And uh, I can show you, let's see if this works here, what we are talking about here. To produce such a component, you see how this works. So you have two tools, one on this side, one on that side, which has the negative of, uh, geometry of the, the gear that you want to produce. This used to be flat. And now you will see what happens. It's under oil, so there's some, some cooling uh, required. Um, usually the way you would do it is you would have a cutting process or milling or turn milling or grinding processes. All these processes produce a lot of waste uh, of material which you do not want to have if you want to produce in a resource efficient way. And you will uh, see uh, how this comes out at the end of this process which uh, takes a little less than one minute. So in uh, less than one minute you have this drive, this, this axle, uh, without any waste produced, uh, uh, there's no finishing machining required, at least not for the reverse gear. We do not yet manage uh, to produce gears for all uh, shifts that you have in a car, but for the reverse gear, it can be done this way, and uh, the vision of the automobile manufacturers would be to uh, get this process implemented for all um, other um, gears that you have uh, in cars and in, in, in all other applications where gears are required. So the, the objective was shortening uh, this uh, total process chain. And you see, if you count this, we, we left out these two uh, just by replacing row and milling, which produces this waste uh, through rolling. So it's, an, it's a forming technology that produces uh, these gears just one one step. And with that, uh, we managed to substitute the stock removal and material saving was uh, between 20 and 30 percent, which is a lot. Uh, to give you an idea here again, if you talk about light weight ink and automobile manufacturing, we work a lot with Volkswagen. And uh, they tell us, well, in order to reduce one kilogram of weight uh, car, uh, it takes at least 1 million euros of research uh, to get there. So it's a, it's a huge investment if you want to reduce weight, and that's something we will see tomorrow. And this is one process uh, that can be used for that. Now, with regard to this um, resource efficiency and, and uh, CO2 emissions, uh, as I said it earlier, um, that's what the automobile industry is, is looking into is now electrical vehicles. Everybody's talking about electrical vehicles. Uh, Germany would like to see one million cars by uh, 2020 uh, on the roads. Uh, I have my doubts and that's going to happen and why. Um, these are some, some of the factors that uh, people are looking into and the impact factor for you as a consumer or us as a consumer uh, when are we willing to, to buy an electrical vehicle? Well, the amortization is uh, dependent on the electricity prices, on tax benefits. Uh, usually states have to subsidize that to, to introduce this sort of new product. Uh, the range of these vehicles is a, a crucial uh, challenge. Uh, many of these cars, I showed you earlier, this BMW electrical vehicle, it has a range of 150 kilometers which is not that far. The Tesla manages to go 500 uh, kilometers. So that's, a, uh, that's a, the magnitude you have to get to in order to be of interest to a, a broad a customer range. Then the car price, batteries are still very, very expensive. And the hybrid versions where you have more or less two drives, the combustion engine and the electrical engine, and that only increases the price. It's also not the, the right way to go. And then again, as with all cars, in this case, the uh, model diversity you want to have your design uh, makes it also very challenging to get into this electrical business. And as I said, 
we want to have one million cars. And I think at this point, also we are a few years down the road already, uh, we may have 15,000 uh, in Germany at this point, not that much more. So there's still a long way to go. And uh, the, the, really the most crucial aspects are the battery, battery life, and then the infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure, uh, a lot is done, certainly with regard to energy generation. Uh, you have all kinds of renewable energies. Uh, in Germany, we produce a lot uh, through wind energy. Unfortunately, it's produced in northern Germany. But how does southern Germany benefit from it? The, the electricity doesn't get there. Um, so battery could be one way. Solar technology is not a uh, way that works that well in Germany. It works very well in India. You have a lot more sunshine in it than we do. Uh, <coughs> so the energy infrastructure is, is a big challenge for engineers again how to transport energy from the place where it's produced to the place where it's uh, required. And then all the, the product related aspects come on top of that. And here you see some of the cars that are about to be introduced to the market. And the product itself is a, is a big challenge. It, it takes a lot more than just taking out the combustion engine and putting in an electrical drive. You see all the uh, components here uh, that have to be addressed by engineers because they require a totally different um, uh, process line, a totally different assembly line. And the batteries, this is not a small battery as you may know from your car in, in these days. Batteries uh, tend to get quite large as you see down, down here. Um, so there's a lot that still needs to be done and at this point it looks like the, the Chinese will take the lead in introducing electrical uh, cars to the road. Um, they are far ahead of, of what we are doing, at least in, in Germany. That's why uh, in the German manufacturers in China are very much uh, interested in looking into this, these fields. One aspect that we are working on, for example, is the drivetrain. So uh, this groove filling, the standard groove filling of an electrical motor is somewhere around 50%. If you manage to increase that, for example, to 80% or more, um, your um, motor gets a lot more efficient, or you can downsize um, the motor. Um, then the assembly, as I mentioned, these, these batteries, that's a big challenge for all electrical cars. We are working on that. And one thing that is coming now uh, in Europe, uh, and in, in uh, uh, the US, they are in this case, I think, uh, far ahead, is this autonomous driving. They do a lot of the test driving uh, in these days so that cars don't need a, a driver anymore. Something you do see already on trains. We know that planes can do that. My wife was a little uh, well nervous about that. Uh, that. That could happen before she retires. But it's, a, it, it's possible. You, you don't need the pilot in the plane. It's just for uh, well, we feel more comfortable if we know that there's someone is sitting in the cockpit. But cars, and that is the next big thing that's about to uh, work aut autonomously. Um, we just did a few test rides um, at Volkswagen. Uh, we went to Sweden where they do a lot of work in, in this field. And that requires a lot of your disciplines that you are uh, going to study here. It's, in this case, it's sensor technology, it's microelectronics, it's communication technology. Um, if, if, we, if we manage to solve the, the left part here, you know, all these electrical aspects, then you really have to solve the, the safety aspects, and that's a question of the vision, for example. How do you recognize whether or not there's a car on the road, whether the car to your left is passing you or not? Um, so th that's, that's something all OEMs are working on and it will take about two to three years before the technical part will be solved. But then the question with regard to insurance, that's in the legal framework for that. That's uh, the challenge that everybody is still looking into and nervous about because if something happens, whose fault was it? You know, was it the driver? Was it the car? Was it the traffic lights, something didn't work, but who's, who tells us what didn't work and who pays for the damage that may or may not happen. But that's a, a huge field uh, where you will find all of the disciplines that they are going uh, to study um, this autonomous driving. Another thing, uh, again, in, 
we started that because of this electrical mobility is um, that there are a lot of materials required which are sort of uh, scarce. Uh, the we want to reduce the the uh, raw materials for uh, all products, but in this particular case, it's rare uh, earth um, metals which are required for magnets. All cars have a lot of magnets now uh, implemented, just to move your mirror or your seat. There are magnets all over the place, and these magnets uh, use. These uh, magnets use rare earth um, metals, and these rare earth. Okay. These rare earth metals are not really that rare. The problem is that uh, here you see where you could find them. So there are uh, quite a few sources all over the world, but by far the largest one is China. So they are not rare, but they are very difficult to get access to. But you do need them for magnets. If you don't have this, this metal, then you won't have a magnet. And if you don't have magnets, then a lot of things don't work in your car. Uh, so what, what we are doing uh, is we try to um, look into that and, and replace that. Here you see the, the cost. Uh, got to get into Next one, what we try to do is we have a major program just within Fraunhofer where we invest a lot of money, actually 10 million euros, uh, to look into um, opportunities to substitute the materials. Is there any other composition of metal that would also um, lead us to the same um, um, magnet that, that uh, manufacturers are using? Uh, these days. Is there any other metal that can replace the rare earth metals that are used today, which are primarily the two, is dysposium and, and uh, neodym? Um, one can certainly optimize the design, which would help us to uh, reduce the amount of these rare earth metals that, that uh, are required for a magnet, but that's, that's not really a solution. Uh, one way that we are looking into is reuse and recycling. Uh, that is uh, getting more and more attention in these days, uh, reuse of materials and components and recycling of components. Um, rare earth metals won't tell you that much. Let me give you another example. Um, in, uh, gold. All of you love gold, right? Uh, have any idea in a standard gold mine, one ton of ore, how much gold do you get out of it? In terms of grams and kilograms, any idea? One ton produces how much gold? It's one gram. One gram out of one ton. You know a much better way to do that? If you look into your mobile phones, all of them contain gold. And you know how often you replace mobile phones. It's at least every other year you have a new one. 42 mobile phones have the same amount of gold than one ton of ore. So all of you can become the modern gold diggers in this world. You just have to find the logistics, how to get these old phones that everybody's throwing away on this mantle, and how to extract the gold out of the mobile phones. But 42 mobile phones would lead to the same amount of gold that uh, modern mines have in these days. And the same idea we have you know, as we come to this rare earth metals. So we try to um, get the magnets back and establish um, process change uh, which allow us to recycle the rare earth metals. And then we suddenly also develop new processes, more efficient processes uh, to uh, produce these metals. Again, we don't want to have any any um, waste material in producing, in this case, metals. But the biggest challenge uh, is uh, material substitution. Uh, we try to avoid 100% the use of uh, rare earth metals. So 100% substitu substitution, that's 
power target, it's an engineering target where you uh, do need materials engineers for sure, uh, but then also in this case, um, the entities that are uh, familiar with the mobile production, in this case, magnet production. Now, a few examples of uh, what uh, Fraunhofer has done in the past. Uh, we know by now it's the MPS3, uh, but that has been around for a while. Uh, we would love to get a second product like that because MP3, if you have a license for MP3 and the entire world is using uh, MP3 uh, players, that brings in a lot of money. Uh, we would love to have a new product because the patents are running out in, in the next couple of years. Um, similar thing we did uh, in the data compressing, uh, that's what it's, this is all about, MP3 uh, data format, that we did for a video format. So we just hold a, a, a license for a huge amount to the company that was interested in this video format. We developed and has continued developing uh, the uh, solar cells. Fraunhofer holds the world record. I think the, the cells that are in the market uh, right now have anywhere around uh, 14 to 15 percent efficiency we are getting uh, towards 50 percent uh, which cannot yet uh, be uh, bought in the market but uh, that's uh, going to happen uh, quite soon so there's still a lot of room in solar technology then uh, solar technology is one way of uh, generation of renewable energies but uh, the other efficient way as we got to energy is uh, just use less energy rather than producing the energy in a different way uh, and uh, energy consumption in manufacturing is a big, big, big issue. Uh, we had a major project, uh, for example, in car manufacturing, and it's just the sheet metals. Um, to give you an idea, we had some 60 companies, uh, plus an OEM, uh, working on reducing the energy consumption in the entire process line just for this sheet metal. And taking out 35% of the energy of an entire process line, uh, 60 companies are involved. You can imagine what significance that, that has for industry. So that's one uh, big issue uh, in engineering, in this case, uh, reducing energy and consumption. Another new technology, it looks a little fancy, it's green tires, but that's what it will be. Um, we developed uh, rubber out of dandelion and uh, it's about to be introduced into the mass market it takes a few years uh, you have the idea again you develop the process you have the prototyping model that work fine but before in this case continental decides to produce tens of millions of tires a year it takes a while so uh, there are a couple of years involved in that but it's about to be introduced um, to the market that the rubber for tires can be made out of dandelion. So there's no trees required anymore. Uh, it's a big development that has been done by Fraunhofer. Um, I mentioned already earlier this, this innovative uh, membrane that uh, prevents piracy of products. It's this 50 micrometer uh, membrane. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, with regard to portable power generators. I um, don't want to get too much into that, so uh, waste management and uh, uh, water management. We have a lot of technologies in, in these fields. I want to introduce you more to one that's a very current topic, and uh, so I can tell you more about that because uh, the Hanover Fair, I think the overall theme of this Hanover Fair was Industry 4.0. It's a new approach that uh, the industry all over the world is now uh, picking up the fourth industrial revolution. Um, that's what it is called. Uh, at least in Europe, it's the fourth. I think the Americans still count it a little different. They say it's the third. Uh, but in our case, it's the fourth. Why the fourth? I'll tell you a little more about that. The first one we consider to be the time when these mechanical machines came out. So this weaving loom at the end of the uh, 18th century, that was the time of we say it's the first industrial revolution because you had these mechanical production facilities which were run by water and steam power. The second one that was then Ford, Henry Ford, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, who introduced this uh, conveyor belt at Ford. 
So uh, block sharing, uh, mass production was the first one who uh, built a series of cars and used electrical energy for that. And then the third one uh, is considered to be the time when this uh, NC technology came out um, at the beginning of the uh, 1970s, so automation of, of production, uh, a lot of uh, different technologies have been introduced at that time. Uh, now we talk about smart factories, uh, the industrial revolution that uh, counts on cyber physical systems. And what that is, I will show you in the next slide. Uh, the cyber physical system, they are able to connect uh, with, with uh, each other and with, with the internet. That's why it's called the cyber. So the device is talking to devices over uh, the internet. They are connecting to the world via sensors. You know, uh, all machines have uh, sometimes hundreds of sensors uh, or planes. Just imagine how many sensors are uh, installed in a plane. And um, and uh, this, this, uh, this, these sensors are part of the, the physical uh, system. And then the sharing of information and the uh, decentralized uh, decision taking that makes it um, through a system. Um, and in addition to that, the cyber physical system do not just uh, help us that machines talk to machines, but also machines to uh, humans and humans to uh, components and machines. And you will see one slide that tells you a little bit in a very simplified way what this uh, is all, all about. Um, there's still a work uh, required. And you say, okay, sure, I can work, work on Saturday, but the machine also says something, switch me on, or uh, the component uh, starts telling the machine, uh, I'm ready for the next step, uh, in this case, lacquering, please, or I need to be at the warehouse like, in two hours. So everybody and everything is communicating with each other. That's what's happening in these days, and it goes through all um, companies, big and small, does not, whoever does not uh, follow this, this new way uh, will have trouble pretty soon in, in staying competitive uh, everybody else is doing that. And that was the topic of the Hanover Fair where thousands of companies um, presented what, what they are up to. Uh, big companies like Siemens with more than 300,000 employees, they say we turn the entire Siemens corporation into an industrial industry 4.0 corporation. So it's a major thing that one should be aware of that that's uh, going to happen very soon. Now, that all of that what I mentioned uh, so far, uh, something that you will see here as well as, as uh, in Europe. Uh, I also picked one topic that uh, I learned actually uh, more here on the Indian side than uh, the, the European side, is Frugal Engineering which I think is an exciting way of uh, designing products uh, specifically dedicated to a market that has not yet seen this product. Frugal engineering, or how it's also called Indian engineering, is the, the science uh, of breaking up complex engineering processes and products into basic components, and then uh, build the product in the most economical uh, economical manner possible. So what I can say, uh, tell you here, but it's not. It's, it's not what this uh, graphic shows you on the right side. It's, it's not that you take an existing product and start on downsizing it and then try to make this product that works in, in a market like in Europe and make it work in a market like in India or in or Asia or in any other part of the world. Uh, frugal engineering really starts with a clean sheet. Uh, that, that is the, 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 the crucial uh, aspect of it. It results in simpler and easier to handle processes and cheaper products with only necessary features. If you look at, for example, our handies, mobile phones can do in these days, they can do a lot more than just taking a call. But is all of that really required for everybody who has these mobile phones? Look at cars. Uh, they have so funny features. Is all of that really necessary if you want to drive a car? Um, in Germany, you see more and more the young generation like yours that say, well, I, I don't really want to own a car anymore. I, I just need a car. I want to get from A to B. And if I need a car, I just lease it for a 
an hour. So why having all these fancy features in, in products like a car, like a, a phone, if we would really understand better what frugal engineering means, uh, we would get to much better products. And that's what I'm convinced about, and I will show you one example where we failed um, to do that. A perfect example for that is the Tata Nano. Uh, it, it was quite a challenge uh, to, to set this target line of uh, producing a car uh, the cost of $2,000. I know that you don't see that many cars uh, in the market right now, but if you look into the details of the engineering of these cars, and I know, you know many companies uh, that are uh, involved in engineering of this, this, of this uh, uh, product, that was probably one of the toughest challenges they had to, to manage. If you have to produce a horn for 10 rupees a piece, you know what that means? Uh, I was so excited to, to learn about that and they have many uh, other aspects you see on the left and on the right, what has been optimized in order to get the costs down and just come out with with the functions that are required in order to call this a car. And you see on the, the bottom line, uh, talking about engineering, some 31 uh, design patterns and 37 technology patterns have been uh, shared. So it's, it's a major invention, this simple car. It looks simple, it sounds simple, but I think it has been quite a, uh, quite a challenge to get there. And one product uh, that I'm familiar with uh, talking about is frugal engineering. Uh, at some point we try to introduce biogas plants to, to India. Uh, that's about four or five years ago. At that time Germany had already 5,000 biogas plants installed. India, five. We were wondering why a country like India that's so desperately looking for for energy, renewable energy doesn't take advantage of this biogas technology because you have a lot of uh, uh, fermentable uh, uh, products, all the, the huge markets that you have, this biodigestible um, waste that you could uh, use um, for biogas plants would have been a perfect opportunity. And uh, we went to that place, this one it was one of the five in, actually in Tamil Nadu. Uh, at that point, as I said, Germany was was the leader, uh, market leader, and the biogas plants that we had looked like the one here on the bottom right. Uh, so this one in India was supposed to produce uh, one megawatt energy. This one, this much smaller one, was supposed to produce at least half of it. But it looked nice, looked fancy, has this wooden uh, walls, and if you looked there, it was really like a nice piece and it uh, looks great in a catalog. But the Indian side uh, really had their, their problems with this one. Why? Uh, you see this one, one megawatt, they got at the cost of $300,000. The one that only produces half of the energy uh, cost seven times more. So the German product just didn't match the expectation at all of the, the Indian uh, customers. And uh, we have really been trying hard to convince our manufacturer, who was the leading manufacturer in, in, in Germany, to think about a frugal engineering approach. Just provide what is really required in order to, to turn this bio waste into energy and, and don't make it look like a fancy catalog product. But they failed. They never managed to get into um, this market although it would have been very simple because this one didn't work. That's how we got to know about that. Uh, it was supposed to provide one megawatt, it didn't work at all. Um, we visited it, it uh, was out of operation for more than, than one year. But it was a simple mechanical problem uh, that uh, led to this failure. Uh, it would have been very easy to actually get that back to work or to uh, use one like this. So. Uh, with a cost factor of more than 10, it doesn't make sense to introduce any product, not from here to India, not from India to China or anywhere in the world. It really has to keep the market in mind, and that's why this uh, frugal engineering is, a, is just a perfect uh, method to uh, look into that. 
um, some business success that we're saying here requires a market oriented alignment between technically feasible and economically reasonable offers. That's where we fail quite often. Um, the German side, they're good in engineering, but we are not that good in taking a market approach. Here's another example. This refrigerator is also um, done by Fugel Engineering. It works great. Uh, low cost, less than $50 refrigerator. Um, so a product that is supposed to be manufactured in large quantities, but at lowest prices. On the other hand, with highest quality. Uh, in order to produce it, that's what we have seen many times. Um, the manufacturers here, as well as other parts of the world, um, use high-tech machine tools and, and special machines. So one does know the, the German machine tool business, but uh, on the other hand, it would be good to take a much stronger market orientation. That is what I really want you to to understand and, and, and to, to absorb as an idea. Never forget the market. Uh, Otherwise, you will really be in trouble with all the engineering expertise that you might have. So frugal engineering is not, and that's what Tata Nano often is, is considered to be a simple low-cost engineering. Yes, they wanted to achieve the low cost of the product, but the engineering as such was quite challenging. Uh, it's, it is instead an overarching philosophy that enables a true clean sheet approach to product development fascinating technology, engineering technology, that um, you might also uh, consider. Now, uh, <coughs> starting point for engineering, um, these are the disciplines uh, that uh, you will have to um, focus on later. And as I saw this morning, it's a good mix uh, of you. It seems to be a group for each and every one of these disciplines. And as you saw in the examples that I just gave uh, for products and technologies that we are working on at Farnova, uh, all of them are very, very relevant, uh, all disciplines, but in order to get there, uh, unfortunately one has to, go to, has to go through the, I think you call it your foundation courses, so you have to learn the basics first before you get to the exciting um, applications of these technologies and get to the uh, products and turn know-how into uh, innovations. Getting back to one of the, the slides I showed in the beginning, our product ideas, uh, what has to be changed, how do we get from there to there? Uh, you know, in the first slide I showed, this customer was running away, but this is not what we want. We want the customer to say, I want it now. How do we get there? Uh, you have to involve the, the customer from the very beginning. Somebody has to ask the customer. And that's also part of this engineering business. That somebody is in touch with the customer, with the companies, with the market. Uh, and within the company, somebody has to ask the question, does it really fit into our strategy? It's nice to have a new product in our product spectrum, but does it really fit into our product line? It's a question that each company has to ask itself. So this gatekeeper function is more than just asking a friend if they like it. And then you still go through all the design process and uh, the manufacturing process. But at some point, uh, somebody has to ask, if, if you have see the first product, will this make money? Will we really get into the market uh, with this? Again, you will ask, have to ask the customer. You see, it's the second time that you involve the customer. You have to your first. Uh, prototypes to the product testing, um, you involve the product manager and you have to have an interactive way of communicating with the market, with the customer, make sure that the product you are going to develop, no matter in what discipline, be it microelectronics, be it mobile manufacturing, whatever, uh, it's always the same, the same thinking, make sure that the customer is, is really looking uh, into that. Uh, and then it goes on to uh, after the prototyping, uh, to the final check um, whether or not that, that is ready, you also have to ask yourself or the salesman are there other ways, could have there been other ways, and then at the very end you introduce it uh, to your customer and at uh, this point you know already that the customer really will agree to your product, will desperately go after it and, and 
want to have it. So uh, the approach is really an innovation-based customer demands. That's what we have to make sure as, as engineers and uh, market-driven product development. And you, by that, you will significantly reduce the risk if you have the um, market knowledge. That is what uh, Fraunhofer also used to say some 200 uh, years ago. One of his words we still like to use is, I have to set aside everything in my scientific endeavors which does not further the product. There are other organizations, research organizations, if you like to continue in the research area, like Max Planck, I think is known here. Uh, their research is done out of curiosity which is also a very, a very important field. They, they are totally free in what they are doing. Uh, they don't have to get to any result. And they can invest 10 years in, in examining something. But if you work with a market orientation like front of us doing, this has to be the focus. It's the product that's uh, desired by the market that you want to see in the market. So that was the topic I wanted to introduce and today. Just a quick outlook to what we are going to, to see uh, tomorrow and tomorrow. It's lightweight uh, concepts. Uh, we'll focus even a little more on um, automobile uh, manufacturing, lightweighting. This uh, is, is the big issue. If you want to reduce the fuel consumption, the CO2 emissions, uh, then lightweighting is the, the way to go, not only in automobile manufacturing. The same, we saw that already in, in aircraft uh, manufacturing. Here you see, the development of weight over the years from 97 of uh, this Golf. So this was a 97 Golf. This is uh, the Golf 7, which, which came out in 2012. And you see that um, the weight has not really changed uh, that much, despite the fact that you add more and more features to this Golf. Uh, if, if you look at um, uh, how this Golf uh, was set up in, in 74, uh, it didn't have automatic um, motors that change your seating or your mirrors or whatsoever, but here everything is, is automated, which means it requires drives, so drives have a certain weight, so you add weight to it. In order not to get to a two-ton car or three-ton car, you have to do something uh, about this line weighting to make sure that whatever weight you put on with another drive, you have to save um, at the other end, uh, for example, in this uh, car body uh, design. So that is something we we will uh, see tomorrow some lightweight concepts, see which, which materials are used. Whether or not the solution will look like that, I tell you tomorrow, it's certainly also a way of lightweighting, just use some balloons. There are many ways of getting there, and I hope that uh, you will come back tomorrow and find out which ways are out there, which ways you could apply to other products, other industries. That's Thank you very much for listening so far.